What if the survival of humanity came down to just two teenagers? Could they really repopulate the earth? Or would genetics turn the family tree into a family stick? Let's dive right in. So there they are, Aiden and Ellie, the only survivors to have not succumbed to the apocalypse. Still in their late teens, the two are in their prime, at least when it comes to baby making. The good news is they have the hots for each other, but can they repopulate the earth? You all know that there's a version of human history that involves two folks getting it on and kicking off mankind. Those two starstruck lovers were Adam and Eve, a couple that made the Garden of Eden their home. We're not exactly sure what kind of food they had to sustain their lives in the garden, but probably a bit more than the forbidden fruit. As for Aiden and Ellie, there's plenty of food on their lonely planet. The old blue ball didn't get whacked by an asteroid or anything similarly cataclysmic. It was forward-thinking artificial intelligence that wiped everything out. But then it destroyed itself just before it could finish off the last two humans. So Aiden and Ellie basically win the We Survive the End of Humanity lottery, except the prize is rebuilding civilization from scratch with zero infrastructure and a lot of awkward family dinners in the future. The Adam and Eve comparison is hilarious, but let's be real. Eden had no mosquitoes, no sewage problems, and no TikTok withdrawal. Also, if AI nuked humanity but left Costco shelves intact, their survival odds are way higher than, say, cavemen trying to invent fire while arguing about rocks. The animals are still around. The AI was programmed to ensure the sustainability of the Earth at any cost, and then it figured out that humans were going to destroy the planet. So the only rational thing to do was to destroy all the humans. Yeah, whoever developed that program sure upset a lot of folks. For the first couple of months, Aiden and Ellie didn't really think much about starting mankind again. They spent much of their time hanging out in rich people's houses and driving fast cars. Ellie almost drove into a tree one day, and after that the couple decided not to take too many risks. There was some serious business to take care of. Thankfully, they lived in Los Angeles, California, which having a mild climate meant the couple didn't have anything to fear from a brutal winter and the fact that there was no electricity. Let's just start by saying that while the apocalypse was a bit of a downer, these two got very lucky in terms of their chances of survival. They also had the added bonus of not being related. That's a good thing, because studies have shown that when children are born from folks who are related, there's a higher rate of infant mortality. Even if the kids did survive, there's a much higher chance that those kids will be born with some kind of defect. Nonetheless, Ellie and Aiden's offspring might be born healthy, but what about the offspring's offspring? Now we run into difficulties. In a study undertaken in Czechoslovakia between the years of 1933 and 1970, scientists looked at the children of parents who were first-degree relatives. First degree is someone in your direct family. Procreating with these people isn't generally a cool thing to do. Honestly, the image of two teenagers joyriding through post-apocalyptic Beverly Hills before remembering, oh right, humanity's future is peak Gen Z apocalypse energy. And yeah, Los Angeles with no winter, that's like the survival mode, easy setting. But then the genetic bottleneck problem kicks in. Aiden and Ellie are fine, but their grandkids? Statistically, it starts looking less like new civilization and more like a medieval royal family with bonus extra thumbs. Nature's not too kind to single family tree experiments. Even if first cousins get it on, the offspring has double the chance of having a birth defect. In that study, the kids who were born to first degree parents didn't have great outcomes. 40% of them had very severe disabilities, 14% of them died because of their disabilities. We have a very good real-life example of this, featuring a man you might think was trying to increase the population of his country. That man was King Chulalongkorn of Thailand, who ruled from 1868 to 1910. The guy did a lot of good things in terms of modernizing his country, and he was also a formidable baby maker, just as his father had been. That father was King Monkut, who had 82 children in total. One of them was Chula Longkorn. Following in his daddy's footsteps, Chula Longkorn had a lot of wives, consorts, and concubines, adding up to 116 women in total. So the king basically ran 19th century Thailand like it was the world's most chaotic dating sim. 116 partners, dozens of kids, and the royal family tree looking more like a tangled set of earbuds. On paper, it sounds like population solved, but when half your children are also your distant cousins, the genetic lottery gets dicey. It's kind of the same trap Aiden and Ellie would face. You can make babies, sure, but after a few generations, it starts looking less like humanity and more like a glitchy inbred dynasty. To keep the bloodline pure, several of his partners, with whom he'd had children, were actually his half-sisters. Back in those days, it still wasn't clear how bad inbreeding was. But the proof soon became evident in the pudding, so to speak. He had a kid with his half-sister, named Daksinajar Nuradhi Rajbutri. It died just hours after it was born. 
he had eight kids with his half-sister Safang Varhana. One of them lived for just three days and most of them didn't make it to adulthood. Varhana herself lived until the ripe old age of 93. She was the product of inbreeding. In fact, if you research what happened to his 77 children, you see that many, and we're talking many, didn't live very long at all. A lot of them died when they were barely out of their fancy infant clothes. Many others died in their 20s and 30s. European royalty was also into keeping things in the family to ensure the bloodline was pure and also to make certain money and property stay within the family after someone passed away. The royal keep it in the family strategy was basically medieval nepotism turned into biology, except the side effects weren't just awkward holiday dinners, but skyrocketing infant mortality. The king kids dropping like flies isn't surprising when half your DNA is just looping back on itself, and Europe wasn't much better. The Habsburgs turned inbreeding into an Olympic sport, with the infamous Habsburg jaw as their family crest. It's wild that keeping property tidy was valued more than, you know, having heirs who could actually survive past puberty. European inbreeding in royal families was very evident in the Spanish Habsburg dynasty. Offspring were often weak and sickly. There was also the now famous deformity called the Habsburg jaw. The internet might have been down in Aiden and Ellie's Brave New World, but they did have access to books and libraries, and being the prudent folks they were, they read up on inbreeding. After going through a few books on the matter, they were rightfully afraid their kids' kids would bite the dust just as soon as they let out that first primal scream, or perhaps spend their short lives hobbling around while carrying a jaw that would put desperate Dan to shame. The couple also read about the Colt family in Australia and the marriage between June and Jim. In short, June was the child of a brother and a sister. She married Jim Colt. They were in New Zealand at the time. They had seven kids of their own and moved to Australia. More kids were born once those kids were old enough to have children, but the Colts didn't stray much farther than their own home, if you get what we mean. The children were born through incest. A lot of the kids had defects and some seemed a little mentally deranged and did things like hurt animals. Many were very sickly and prone to disease. Incest wasn't working out so well for the family. When an investigator found them, he said it was like nothing I'd ever seen. The story sent shivers down Aiden and Ellie's spines, with both of them just sitting for a while in the library thinking about a team of kids running around with fungal feet trying to set cows on fire. The royal keep it in the family strategy was basically medieval nepotism turned into biology, except the side effects weren't just awkward holiday dinners, but skyrocketing infant mortality. The king kids dropping like flies isn't surprising when half your DNA is just looping back on itself, and Europe wasn't much better. The Habsburgs turned inbreeding into an Olympic sport, with the infamous Habsburg jaw as their family crest. It's wild that keeping property tidy was valued more than, you know, having heirs who could actually survive past puberty. But did it have to be that way? That's the big question today. Some, not many, of King Chula Longcorn's children that he had with sisters went on to have fairly normal lives, though admittedly it's hard to find kids who lived past the age of 40. Aiden and Ellie were now certain that a small gene pool was going to lead to a future offspring of physically and mentally ill kids once their own children started procreating. But what choice did they have? They had one kid, a boy, and named him Carl. Then they had another kid and they named him Asher. Damn, they thought, two boys. Then Carl accidentally killed Asher when they were fighting over toys. Well, that escalated faster than a Shakespeare tragedy. Two kids into humanity's grand reboot and boom. Carl pulls a full Cain and Abel speed run without even realizing he's cosplaying Genesis. Imagine Aiden and Ellie's reaction. Great, we're supposed to save humanity and instead we've just reinvented sibling homicide. At this rate, the family tree isn't branching out. It's just snapping in half before it even starts growing. After which Ellie and Aiden had a third child and named him Sebastian, another boy. With not much to do, these last two adult humans just kept pumping out kid after kid, as many in fact as was possible given Ellie's natural aging process. The kids, for the most part, grew up fine, but the kids' kids were a different matter altogether. Let us explain something now before we get to the strange case of the extended family. You heard of that thing called DNA. While it has packaged into its 23 pairs of chromosomes, within every chromosome there are hundreds of thousands of genes. It's these things that will determine human characteristics such as hair color, but some of them are also bad to the bone, sometimes literally. Every gene has a couple of copies and they are called alleles. When two people have a child, they pass on one pair to the child. There are dominant and recessive genes too. If one pair of genes is dominant, you will have a trait of that gene when it's passed to you. With recessive genes, it's different because you need both pairs of the genes to gain the trait. For example, the gene for brown eyes is dominant. 
so if you get that, you will have brown eyes. But for blue eyes, it's different, because that gene is recessive. You need both recessive genes to get blue eyes. In this case, both your parents passed on blue-eyed pairs of genes. But if one of your parents had the brown-eyed gene, you'd get brown eyes. Importantly though, as you know, not all children get the same DNA from their parents unless they are twins. You get 50% of your DNA from both parents, making 100%. Now imagine that DNA, say from your mom, was half a pack of cards. When the next child is born, that pack is shuffled, so the next child doesn't get the same DNA with all the same genes. But if there were lots of children and you kept shuffling the pack, at some point, some sets of genes will look similar to another child's. This is important to know as we go along with the Aiden and Ellie story. The good news is that many defective traits are carried in recessive genes. This is great because they aren't very common, and to get a harmful trait, you have to get a pair of them. This is exactly why it's good to play the field with strangers. Okay, that's a joke, but if your parents are related, there's more of a chance that they carry some defective gene, and in that case, the child might get a pair, and one thing leads to another, a child is born with a chin that looks like an old boot. If there are generations all from the same gene pool, at some point, even with all the shuffling, some bad genes might match up. The Habsburg Charles II of Spain was the man famous for his chin. It took generations of inbreeding to make him like that. In fact, he was born with scores of defects and disabilities which made his life hell. After many years of suffering, he died at age 38. Just to give you an idea of what can go wrong, here's his autopsy report. Heart was the size of a peppercorn, his lungs corroded, his intestines rotten and gangrenous, he had a single testicle black as coal, and his head was full of water. This guy really was the final boss of inbreeding, and his autopsy reads less like a medical report and more like a Tim Burton prop list. Heart like a peppercorn, lungs corroded, one coal black testicle. That's not a king, that's a Dark Souls mini boss. And this is exactly what Aiden and Ellie's descendants risk turning into. Every family reunion slowly morphing into a monster manual. You don't restart humanity just to end up speedrunning medieval body horror edition. When Ellie read that, she fainted on the spot just thinking about future generations of her family. The first thing that came to mind was a grandkid of hers looking like a character from a movie she'd watched as a kid called The Toxic Avenger. But then one day she was reading from another book, and something improved her grim mood. She read the lines, The evidence for the short-term effects of low genetic diversity is very strong, but all these things are probabilistic. There are stories of incredible journeys back from the brink. Anything is possible. You can get very lucky playing cards. Ellie tried to translate that in layman's terms and came to the conclusion that if she and Aiden knocked out enough kids, and those kids knocked out enough kids, then despite the fact that there will be lots of challenges, cow burning even, some of those kids could possibly flourish and the future of mankind could be in the bag. Ellie's hair eventually turned a shade of gray and at that time her beloved husband was a formidable farmer. Things didn't seem too bad. But some of her grandkids had lives that were, as one of her favorite writers would have put it, nasty and short. She and Aiden had 10 sons, 18 daughters in total. They in turn had kids with each other because that's just how things had to be. Evolution actually wants us to be attracted to people who are genetically different from us, but the future of mankind demanded they make do with each other. Ellie fainting at the thought of birthing a toxic Avenger grandkid is honestly the most relatable apocalypse mom moment ever. But then, plot twist, she finds the one optimistic science line that basically says, hey, genetics is just high stakes uno, maybe you'll get lucky. So she and Aiden crank out 28 kids like they're running a reality show called 19 Kids and Literally Humanity. Evolution's whispering, please diversify, while survival shouting, nope, family-only dating app it is. Ellie was still worried, having read that there's more of a chance of defects the more inbreeding takes place, such as what happened to the Habsburgs. If only Ellie knew what genes all of her grandkids had, she could safely match them so children weren't born unhealthy, but that wasn't possible. She had a reason for some optimism, though, when she read about the people of the small island called Pingalap, who lived far from the busy world in the western Pacific. These people were almost wiped out in the 18th century when a typhoon struck the island, but 20 of them survived. They flourished after, even though a recessive gene ensured that many years later a tenth of the island was afflicted with color blindness. The thing was, this disorder, called complete achromatopsia, was thought to have come from one man, but it didn't show up in the population until the fourth generation, but still not everyone got it. This made Ellie happy. She sat there with the book in her hand, and with one of her granddaughters crying from a crib nearby, she repeated those words in her mind. 
Anything is possible. Anything is possible. We are going to bounce back, she said under her breath in a determined voice. Even though out of the corner of her eye, she glimpsed one of her less successful byproducts giggling while throwing an aerosol can into a small fire. There was a long way to go yet, and what's called the founder effect was still in full swing, meaning a profound lack of genetic diversity as generations interbreed. Still, while Ellie's family admittedly all looked very similar, she held out hope that in generations to come, there would be natural mutations and some diversity would occur. Ellie clinging to the Pingalap story is so wholesome, like sure, some descendants will see the world in 4K, others in black and white CRT mode, but hey, at least they'll be alive. That's apocalypse level optimism. The founder effect basically turned her family tree into a Xerox machine, but she's betting on mutations to spice things up. Meanwhile, in the background, one kid's inventing the world's first Mad Max flamethrower with an aerosol can. Yeah, bouncing back might take a few more generations. Since Aiden in those days seemed only interested in tending to his vegetables and cattle, he becomes so distant, Ellie read more and more. In some ways, they were a perfect couple, with she being the academic one and he being so good with his hands. One day, Ellie told Aiden that there were instances in history in which animals likely created entire populations after staring as pairs. They were eating when she looked at him and shouted, RATS! What? replied Aiden, feeling confused. She told him a single pair of rats started a population on some island and the rats thrived. He then gave her a familiar look and said, don't tell me you read that in one of those printouts from that old website Quora. Ellie went quiet and returned to her room, where she read the printout again. It said, Starlings in North America originated from just 60 individuals. There are a couple hundred million of them now, most of which are nearly genetically identical. That seemed like good news, but she understood that a small population was different from the last two. She couldn't find any examples in her books when an animal species had gone down to the last pair and then started up again. Ellie died first. She was 93. Aiden, 92, held her hand as she drifted into the great unknown. At her side were all her kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids. One of them, known as Chinny to the rest, made her moan in distress just before passing away. That poor kid had just put some broken glass in his mouth. But she remembered some words written by a scientist back in 2015. If the whole world were founded by two people, you would have to get lucky in the genetic lottery many times. Ellie and Aiden might have been lucky, but as Ellie took her dying breath, she just couldn't know. Surrounded by all those faces, things didn't look too bad. Nonetheless, she knew things could take a turn for the worst. She also knew that a long time ago some researchers said you'd probably need 98 unrelated humans to repopulate a planet. But there she was, looking at people who had come from her and Aiden. So, could it happen, really, the repopulation of the planet from these two? The answer is yes, it could, maybe. But as those scientists said, there would have to be a lot of luck. Perhaps if it did happen, thousands of years later, no one would believe the story of Ellie and Aiden, the avid researcher and the Cabbage Patch Kid. The reality is scientists aren't sure how we evolved at the beginning, but they certainly don't think it all kicked off with two randy people in the Garden of Eden. They know there were a couple of types of humans, the Homo genus hanging out in Africa around a couple million years ago, such as Homo habilis, handyman, Homo erectus, upright man, and then it took quite a while for the presence of Homo sapiens, uptight man. Just kidding, it can be translated as wise man. Before Homo sapiens, the oldest form of humans mated with the newer kinds of humans, such as Homo neanderthalensis, Neanderthals. Neanderthals and modern humans also mated. So in short, it wasn't as if there was only a very small gene pool when things started. With that in mind, we can't look at the case of Ellie and Aiden and compare it with something from the past. We can only hypothesize that if two people were left alone on the planet, they might be able to fill it up again. It's a long shot, but Ellie and Aiden at least tried. After that, you really should watch why it would suck to live through the end of the universe. Or have a look at this. Honestly, the infographics show really nailed this scenario. Like, it's part science lecture, part doomsday fanfic, and somehow makes incest charts entertaining. Huge props to them for working it out so vividly. Go check them out, links in the description. And hey, if you thought rebuilding humanity with two teenagers was weird, wait till you see what's coming next. Here you can find the next video. Stay nerdy.